Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, it's getting late in the day, and I don't know about you, but after lunch, I'm feeling a little bit of the sleepies. So I'm running on about three cups of coffee. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about my, uh, my team and company's journey to adopting GitOps and how Flux um, helped us to do it. All right. So <clears throat> a long time ago, and this was July of last year, I joined CoreCard, which is a small uh, financial services company in Atlanta. They do transaction processing software for credit cards. Been around about 20 years. And they're in the midst of a complete ground up rewrite of their primary software um, using uh, Kubernetes microservices, cloud native for, you know, uh, from the get go. So it's all pretty brand new stuff to them. They're about a year into their, now about two years into their rewrite. So I came in a little late to the game, but at the time I came in, uh, and I was brought in to put together a DevOps team to help them get control of, um, of their environments. Essentially, the developers were running everything, and they're excellent developers doing a great job, but as far as infrastructure and managing deployments and things like that, they were just doing what was expedient to get their, get their work done. So a lot of technical debt had built up and um, problems like that. So some of the major factors that my, my boss and I talked about were the deployment process was getting longer and longer. And that was directly related to some factors that I'll go into in just a second. There was no process for managing deployments um, into, or promoting deployments into different environments. Literally, they were building something, put it in dev, build something else, put it in QA, build something else. You can get the picture there. Um, at the time, there were six Kubernetes environments all six of them were different, every single one of them. Everybody had an opinion of which one was right. Um, and as a result of this, our, our costs in the cloud were escalating pretty quickly. So a lot of problems. All right, so my team was given a lot, of, a lot of agency to do whatever we needed to do to fix it. I had the benefit of the, the person who hired me, and I had a previous professional relationship. So he knew me already. He had a lot of trust in me. And he placed a lot of trust and responsibility in me and the two people on my team to you know, right the boat. All right, um, But we did have a couple of guardrails. One, we could not disrupt the development team's productivity. Um, nothing long term. We couldn't take things down for a week at a time while we fixed something. We needed to make changes that would integrate as seamlessly as possible with what was already going on. That sounds easy, but it, it really wasn't. Um, and then on top of that, we could not um, see any measurable increases in our cloud spend. Actually, they wanted it to go the other direction. And we couldn't, we just, you know, budgets are budgets, we couldn't increase the, um, the spend. So no big software packages, anything like that. We needed to look heavily into open source and um, either bespoke stuff that we developed in-house. All right. So the, the two other people on the DevOps team who were contractors, actually, not full-time employees, I was, I was the only FTE, um, decided, all right, let's figure out what we've got before we figure out where we're going to go. So we had six, six Kubernetes clusters running in, in Azure, so AKS. It was a mix of .NET and Java microservices. The .NET services were all sitting in a mono repo. There were about 12 different services running there. And then the Java services were all in individual repos. They were all being deployed via Helm charts. The .NET repo was a single Helm chart that covered all of the services in that repo. And then a single Helm chart for each of the, the Java repos. The build and deployments were all handled by different code branches. So there is a deploy dev, there's a deploy QA, a deploy UAT, deploy prod one, deploy prod two, with no process whatsoever for promoting, again, promoting and reconciling up through all those different releases. So it was a disaster. And then the very last thing we found that really got me going was they're storing secrets in code. And that kind of sent me over the edge. <laughs> all right. So this is kind of what our build process looked like when, when I got there. So this is a rough approximation of what our .NET repo looked like. So going from left to right, that's kind of our repo. They have bird code names for all our different services. A, any commits would then go to one of the deployment branches. So deploy dev, it would build everything. Every single service would get built. 
I could change one file and I'd build 12 different microservices. Then I'd go in and it'd run the Helm, Helm <clears throat> excuse me, it'd deploy the Helm chart. All 12 services would get deployed. Same thing for all of the other environments. So not very efficient at all. But then we dug a little deeper and we started to find some other things that were problems, kind of the, call them the underlying, underlying you know, indicators of where the real issues were. Every environment infrastructure was literally the same because they built it once, exported the code as, um, as BICEP, and then they were just using that as a cookie cutter for other environments. So we ran into all kinds of problems like, well, now we need to VPN into uh, Visa and MasterCard to run tests against their, their test services. Well, now we have to do, because we have overlapping IP addresses in our VNet address spaces, we have to do really ugly um, NAT translation to be able to, to connect two different VPNs with, with those same spaces. Um, that infrastructure's code was incomplete. Even though they could punch out a new environment with it, they'd spend another week with all the little tweaks they needed to do just to get it to running. Um, all the different supporting services, things like our, our, our Loki and Prometheus stack, um, Dapper, those kinds of things, were all being deployed manually with um, Helm and, and kubectl. The, um, the large repo, which I, I've been talking about, which had 12 services, they were expecting that number of services to double in a year. And it took, it took about eight months for it to double. It's actually almost 30 services now. Um, and as I said, that mono repo built everything and deployed everything, regardless of what code changed. So there was no differentiation at all. Um, and there's no source of truth. Everybody, like I said, everybody thought they were right and which, which environment was correct. And what it really ended up being is the environment of the day ended up being the correct environment. And that, those were just the worst things. I don't want anybody to get the opinion that the, the dev teams didn't know what they were doing. Again, excellent developers, but not DevOps infrastructure focused people. All right, so just a couple of metrics. Average build and deploy time on that mono repo was about 15 minutes. We were averaging two builds and deployments a day. And that was it. Probably close to 60 or 70 commits going into that repo in a day. So not, not very efficient, not seeing a lot of turnaround and the ability to test and, and, and see that nice continuous integration, continuous deployment. And we were spending roughly $60,000 a month in the cloud. That's not a big number. If any of you guys work for large enterprises, that's chump change. We're not a big company, so that, that's a lot of money for us. All right, so we started to think, how do we, how do we write this ship? And we, um, all of us had dabbled in, in GitOps and were familiar with it. You know, we read industry papers, blogs, those kinds of things, but we had never actually implemented it. So we started to look at, all right, what are the four principles of GitOps? You know, raise your hand if you've seen this today, <laughs> probably the 50th time. So de declarative. That really struck to me because I wanted a single source of truth. As a small team, there's no way we were gonna all remember everything ourselves or be able to document it all. We needed to have a place, a central repo that was gonna be our, well, was gonna be our documentation. It needed to be versioned and immutable. It, people were going into the clusters and making manual changes themselves. We wanted to prevent that. We wanted some kind of reconciling process that would make sure that it was so the clusters are staying true to our source of truth. We wanted any changes that were being deployed correctly to be done automatically. And we wanted those to be, that the clusters are gonna be continuously reconciled. So GitOps really was singing, singing the tune that we were looking to hear. All right, so we chose GitOps as just, uh, and obviously that's just one key to the, to the entire solution that we had to implement. As part of that, the, the main focus is that we wanted to occur where we were going to rewrite our infrastructure as code. We had to go to something that was a little more parameterized where we could build environments quicker, accurately, but not worry about things like IP addressing and um, conflicts like that. We wanted them to be structurally equal, but unique to each environment. We wanted to create new build and deployment pipelines to allow a more efficient process. You know, there's no reason to build 12 or now 30 services just because one file in one service changed. Um, maybe we need one, maybe we need two, maybe we need 30, but we wanted it, the, the pipelines to reflect what was actually changing, and we didn't want to have to deploy everything. We wanted approval gates. 
when I first got in there, anybody could press a button and deploy into our production environment. Luckily, it wasn't a true production environment yet, but it is now. So having deployment gates, especially as a fintech company, you know, it's just not, it's not gonna fly without those. Um, we wanted to manage as much as possible as code. Again, give us that single source of truth so we wouldn't have to remember everything. So we didn't have to have that institutional knowledge in our own brains. You know, the proverbial, what happens if Ed gets hit by a bus tomorrow? Please know. Um, you know, we needed, we needed that documentation. All right, uh, and we had to eliminate secrets from source code. That's, that's kind of a separate thing from GetOps. That's just the absolute minimal best practice you've gotta have. So that was something we needed to look at and just kind of make sure we were taking care of that along the way. And then like DevOps and DevSecOps and all the other things that have come up over the last decades, um, this was gonna be an iterative process. You know, there's no one solution that fits everybody. Um, we're, we wanted to build something quick and fast that could solve at least the bulk of the big problems, see what works, and then continue to improve on that. All right. So some of the tools we chose. Uh, our ultimate goal is for our, our software solution to be multi-cloud, so we, went, we wanted to get away from Bicep. No offense to any of my, my Microsoft friends. I hate Bicep. It's wordy and verbose and just difficult to work with, that's an opinion. <laughs> uh, so we chose Terraform, we, had some, we already had some experience with it, my experience myself as well as the other people on my team. Um, so we, we decided to go there. No reason to learn three different tools to deploy into environments when we could just learn one scripting language. Uh, we're already using GitHub Enterprise, no reason to change from there. Um, we decided to use uh, the external secrets operator uh, paired with uh, Azure Key Vault and then you know, eventually we'll use the other GCP and AWS um, secrets providers for our, to solve our secrets problem. And then, um, so GitOps tools, really the, the last decision we needed to make before we actually started to make changes. So we started to do a little research and uh, the, the two big ones that came up, ask me if you've heard these words today, or tell me if you've heard these words today, Argo and, and Flux. So we started to look at there. Um, Jenkins popped up a few times too. Uh, I shied away from Jenkins. It was a lot more tool than we really needed. Um, the only parts of Jenkins that were really relevant to us were a very small percentage of it, and I just didn't see a reason to implement a, a large tool set like that when Flux and Argo would fit the bill. So we had to move quickly. We did a very, very fast evaluation of our use case and how quickly could we implement Argo and Flux and get it to do what we wanted to do. We found both tools to be excellent. Um, you know, Argo is more of a fully featured application where Flux is a set of operators, so it's more of a toolkit. Um, we did find Argo was much more complicated to retrofit into our existing environment. Uh, reusing our Helm charts was a little difficult. We had to make some changes to get, get Argo to work with it. Uh, Flux picked them up right out of the box, didn't have any trouble there. Um, we liked that Argo allowed you to define some exclusion periods during reconciliations. Uh, Whereas Flux doesn't have it, I understand it's on the roadmap, so I'm looking forward to that if it, when, it, when it hits. Um, there's just some times where you don't want changes to be made where you need to freeze things. Um, Argo has a little bit, has much better tooling for doing app promotions. Uh, Flux doesn't do any of that. It's really something left up to you, which in some ways makes it a little more flexible, but you still have to develop that yourself. Argo comes with a UI and a, and a CLI. That's pretty nice. Flux is just a CLI, but there are, there's of course the Weaveworks UI and then other third parties have developed different kinds of UIs for it. UI wasn't really a big deal to us. Um, I'm old enough that I grew up in a world where there was no such thing as a UI, it was all command line. So it's, I don't shy away from it. Um, Argo has, uh, has its own RBAC controls, whereas Flux uses the native Kubernetes RBAC. We liked the Flux approach only because we needed to move fast and we didn't want to have to learn yet another security layer. So that's kind of a, you know, that was a more of a personal choice. It really, there's no plus or minus there for us. Um, they both handle multiple clusters without really any, any issues. So they're both fine tools. I have no issues with Argo and in no way am I um, promoting Flux and not promoting, promoting Argo. It came down to what fit our use case the, the best and that was how quickly could we get it implemented and in a way that 
that solved the issues we wanted to solve. So Flux was our answer. All right. So really simplistically, all we do in Flux is we have, um, and this is a very simple version of, of it. So going from left to right, we have a, either just a set of manifests or a, a Helm chart that's been pushed up into an OCI repository. And then we have three layers of, oh, three overlay layers. We have what we call our base layer. That's change, uh, that's, sorry, losing my, temp, my uh, train of thought. Those are setting changes that need to occur at, at, on every cluster. And there's a reason we're doing that as an overlay versus putting it directly into the Helm chart. That's a longer conversation. Then we have what we call our environment layer, which is going to be our dev, UA, T, QA, prod, whatever layers. And those are the specific settings meant only for those environments. And then we have, I don't actually show it here, but it's our, our cluster layer, which is where the, the flux bootstrapping is going into, but it's settings specific to a cluster. Now we differentiate between environments and clusters uh, because we have three QA environments. We have two production environments at, at the moment and two dev environments. So we want all of our dev environments to look the same, but the clusters for those may be a little bit different. Anyway, on the very far, so this is a, just a basic flow of what the overlay layers look like if you haven't worked with customize before. You start with a manifest, the next layer is making a change to the replica. So it's going from zero to one replicas. So by default, every environment is gonna have one replica. Then we've defined in our performance environment because we're, we wanna test some scaling here, we're gonna actually spin up five replicas. And we're also gonna define some other things um, such as we're gonna have a different container port instead of the default um, 8080, we're gonna do it at 9,000. And then you have your final um, rendered manifest, which is what actually gets applied by Flux to that cluster. All right. This is kind of a demonstration, or not a demonstration, a view of what our directory structure looks like. And I actually decided, because I don't like that how that picture came out, to show you what, don't worry, this is all, oh, you can't actually see it. Well, that's dumb. There, let's try that. Nothing here is proprietary. <laughs> I can't actually see it. Crap. All right. Um, so what you end up with is the charts. We told all our Helm charts. Then you have a Flux folder, which is really the um, all the overlays. There is an, an Apps folder. Our base is that base layer of common functionality um, overrides for every environment. Then you see Dev East One, Dev East Two et cetera. You see, we have a lot of different environments. Then we have the clusters folder further down. And I'm going to go back to this um, at the end if I have time and just show you a really quick demo of how easy it is for us to make changes at, a, at the cluster level. All right, let's see if I can drag this back over. Yeah, good enough. All right. All right, Windows. Windows is misbehaving. So, let me make sure where I'm at here. Okay, good. All right. So that was how we implemented, or not how we, but that was our basic implementation for Flux. It's very simple. There's still a lot of functionality that we haven't taken advantage of in Flux, but that got us started and enabled us to now move to how do we speed up these deployment pipelines? Because 15 minutes is ridiculous. And this is a basic workflow. So everything above is our is our CI and everything below is our CD, all right? So it starts, your developer's in there, writes some code, he commits it to GitHub. Our workflow is gonna build that. Um, it's gonna take the Docker file and build a new container image and push it out to our ACR repository. Once that's done, the user has the option to deploy it. So where are they deploying it to? Dev or QA? All that is gonna do is update the manifest file overlay for that environment with the new container image tag. That's it. No other, no, nothing else is done as far as deployment. Our, our GitHub enterprise repos can no longer talk to our Kubernetes clusters directly. We've cut off and removed all, all keys, access, and whatnot. Um, nothing can actually reach out and in except through um, our VPN or Bastion hosts. 
that's great. So how do we deploy? Well, Flux is sitting out there on our clusters reconciling those manifests. It's going to pick up that new image change, and it's going to pull in that new image and deploy it out into the cluster. Pretty simple. Um, takes a lot of the, the guesswork out of it for us. Our Helm um, deployments work the same way. So really, the, our, our releases are defined by two things, the Helm chart version and the image. So the, the workflow is exactly the same for a Helm chart. Developers are going to come in, make changes to the Helm chart. Maybe they're tweaking something in one of the existing manifests or adding some new, new manifest into it. Uh, could be anything. They're going to bump the Simver, deploy that, or commit that into the repo. Our workflow is going to pick it up. It's going to package that Helm chart, push it up to the container registry. Again, it's going to ask the user which environments they want to push that version to, dev or QA. It's going to update the overlay. Flux is going to pick up that change, and it's going to redeploy that Helm chart. That's a little bit bigger of a deployment than just pulling in a new image, but the operation is essentially the same. So with these two things implemented and working pretty well, and I'll get into some, some of the continuous integration things that we need to, or things we need to iterate on, because there are some serious flaws to how we do this, is we took some more steps, and this is as of a couple days ago. So our average build time is now down to three minutes, and I tell you, the developers love it. This was what you would call the quick win. If any of you did consulting or do consulting, you know, it's always about the quick win, make the client happy. This made the developers happy. They, I had the trust of my, my boss. When we pulled this off and were able to demonstrate it for the developers, they love our team now. So we are, we are aces with them, and they give us a lot of leeway. Um, they're a little more open to us interrupting their, their day to day. We're averaging about 20 builds and deploys a day. We even had a peak day of 90. That was right before our, um, a production release we did. They were trying to hammer out some, uh, some bugs in their UAT environment. Our cloud spend has gone down about 53, or down to about 53 grand a month. That's not too bad, but we, we dug a little deeper into the numbers and we realized some things. So we went from 60,000 to 53,000 a month, but we're now running almost twice as many Kubernetes clusters, um, as well as managing five on-premises. That doesn't really count in our cloud costs, but so really our, um, our cloud spend per cluster, per unit of virtual CPU, or however you know, the, the money people want to count that, has significantly improved. And a lot of that was just being, being able to look at those, those cookie-cuttered environments and, and eliminating a lot of duplication. No reason to have bastion hosts to connect to every lower environment when you could have you know, one set of hosts and VMs to connect to you know, everything from dev to your, you know, to your performance environments, and then one set for your, your upper environments, things like that. Um, some economies of scale, I guess, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right term or not. Um, None of this would have been possible without Flux or, or another GitOps tool because it took a lot of the workload off of us. It allowed us to you know, really focus on solving some of the other, other problems like our infrastructure um, design, our deployment processes, and you know, those other important factors. So what's planned for the future? I have no issue with Helm, but I find them unnecessary for what we're doing. Um, our, our software is not going to be distributed via Helm charts to clients. We will be setting it up and installing it and managing it for them. So it's just another step in our build process. If we make a change to a Helm chart, we've got to build that, push it, update manifest, and run that through a whole series of, of an, um, a whole progression of environments. I would like to just go to straight up manifest and let the overlays do their work. Uh, in Flux, you can't patch a Helm chart directly. You have to do a post render on it if you want to. Unless you want to, only thing, you, sorry, only thing you can patch are the values files um, without a post render. Um, we're finding that there are certain things that we need to. Thank you. Um, that we're finding that there are some things that we need to do to patch, and we'd rather not build a new Helm chart to do that. So we're, um, that's kind of leading us down this road to, to eliminate the Helm charts and just go to straight manifests and pushing those manifests up into an OCI repository and then just letting, you know, letting the overlays take place. Um, we want to look at the image CRDs that, that Flux has. Uh, 
let Flux handle pulling in those new images and updating, updating our repositories instead of doing it as part of our CI process. I don't know if any of you saw the, the Acuity presentation about cargo. I think that was it. I'm really interested in that. That actually could solve this, this exact problem. Um, we do have a security issue where our cluster is, or our repo has access or has definitions for all of our clusters, including production. That, so right now we have security tightened way down. There's three people that can access it. Um, that's not very scalable. So we're going to split out our production and lower environment clusters into separate and kind of a thing of it like a Y, lower environments production, and then all of our manifests will be lower. Uh, we want to get Terraform into our GitOps process. Right now it's not. We're just Terraform plan and apply out from the command line. Uh, we just haven't gotten to it. Um, we're manually rotating our secrets and certificates. We want to automate that. Um, and we want to start moving app settings, you know, like your app, your app settings.dev, um, to configuration as code. Again, that focus of GitOps, everything is code. Um, and that's, that's it. I put a couple of resources on here. This is a newer deck than what I have on the website. Um, I'm going to see if I can't get this updated just so you guys have the latest stuff if you want it. Um, it's just links to documentation and stuff. Um, one thing I will say about Flux, Argo has pretty good public facing support, but I, the, the Slack channel for Flux was excellent and instrumental in, in helping me solve a couple of really good problems. And there's always a good crowd on there willing to help out. So um, I have about two minutes, I think, maybe, if anybody has a question. Yes? Yeah it, yeah, it was really around the Helm charts. And I, I tried to go back and remember what, what it was about our Helm charts that made it difficult to, to fit them directly into Argo. Um, but it, it has to, I don't know if there were certain elements that, that Argo didn't support or something like that. See, Flux uses the, actually uses the Helm um, SDK. So it supports whatever Helm supports, it's going to support. Whereas Argo actually, I believe, compiles the Helm chart first and then it does all of its reconciling. And there's, there's, there was something there that we were running into, and it was just, uh, it was requiring a lot of extra work, whereas we didn't have to do that with Flux. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, no, but now that you mention it, I'm probably going to. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Yeah, so, wow, I could talk all day about the, that meeting when I found out they were in code. So, uh, well, getting them out of code was a nightmare because we actually went back to all our branches, everything. We wanted to pull them from the very beginning out, even though they were expired, none, they weren't valid, any, you know, no, there were no valid credentials left, but they were still, being, they were still in there. Um, we, it was really kind of a manual process. We got them all, we found out what was needed, got them into Key Vault, and then just used the external secrets operator, which works really well with Key Vault and, and a lot of other secret providers. And yeah, that's, that's just what we're doing. We're looking at maybe using um, Hashi Vault in the future, because uh, we do have the issue where we need to start rotating and things like that, and it just handles it for you with their ephemeral you know, secrets operators and certificate rotators and all that stuff. So just haven't gotten there yet. Um, Anybody has one last question? All right. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. It's always nice to ramble on. <laughs>